ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله سبحانه وتعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر أمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد My dearest brothers and sisters and youngsters Today what are the headlines about the Middle East? The families of the Ghazans, our brothers and sisters the BBC reports are returning to inspect the damage done in their neighborhoods. Al Jazeera reports the story of one Palestinian lady, our sister Um Ahmed. When they're coming back during this five day ceasefire, this is the second day today, what they find is their homes have been reduced to total rubble. Um Ahmed could be heard crying in the streets when she found her home that she only purchased last year had been completely demolished because of the Israeli strikes. She cried out that this home, I only bought it last year and I'm still to pay for it. I'm a widow. My husband was killed in the last war and this time round, my son is in hospital. This is the scene that they are seeing today. As we stand here, they stand before their broken homes during the ceasefire. So we ask Allah first and foremost, thinking about this calamity that stayed in the life of 1,960 brothers and sisters, most of which are civilians and a great portion of them, young children. I mean, imagine a 10, 12, 5 year old that you know. Most of the people killed there, or a great many of them, are in fact children like these. So we ask Allah first and foremost to have mercy on our brothers and sisters there, to aid them in their time of need and to accept all of their deceased as martyrs. Martyrs, who the Prophet said their souls will be inside the bellies of beautiful green birds as they roam the skies of paradise, perched underneath the Arsh of Rahman. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. We also Allah, ask Allah Jalla wa'ala to, to deal with this aggressive, brutal regime known as the Israeli state too. To rid this world of this corrupt and unjust state known as the Israeli state. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. But the thing is, my brothers and sisters, we've seen so many headlines reach the news in the last six weeks about our brothers and sisters there in Gaza. In fact, more than that, all around the world, in Iraq and in Sham, so much hurt, heartache, tests and tribulations. These images, these videos, these headlines that we've reached, they've been very difficult for us to understand, to make sense of. In fact, some of us have begun to lose hope. What is all of this suffering that the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is going through? What does Allah Jalla want by all of this? How am I supposed to understand this in light of what I know of Islam? This khutbah will be dedicated to explaining this. What is it that Allah Jalla wa wants and desires when he tests a slave, a community, a nation? What is it exactly that we are supposed to do in these times? And so for that, I bring to you three points. The first is that Allah Jalla wa'ala has intentionally and purposefully made testing, tribulation a part of human life. Would that be the personal life, the family life, the community life, or the life of the nation? Allah has inbuilt into that life test, trial, and tribulation. The second point is how does Allah want us to behave in times of test. What is it that Allah wants to see us do when the going gets tough, when it's very difficult, when we are being tested, when calamity is befalling us, how are we meant to respond as believers in Allah? That is the second point. And the third, what do tests and trials serve? Do they serve any higher purposes, any wisdom behind them? And for that, for sure they are. I will relate to inshallah by Allah's permission five wisdoms behind why Allah tests us. So going back to the beginning, point number one. We all know that test is something Allah has intended for us. But did you know how explicitly Allah mentioned it in the Quran? Look for example at the second verse of Surah Al-Mulk. 
that he created death and life, meaning our own existence. Why? So that we may live in peace, so that we may be happy people living in a wonderful community, always thriving. No. Allah said, لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ in order to test and to trial them. Why? أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلُ to see that when the test is brought about, who from amongst my people responds positively during the test? Allah said something very similar to that insan. إِنَّا خَلَقَنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ نُطَفَةٍ أَمْشَاهٍ نَبَتٍ that indeed we created man, us, human beings, from this reproductive mixed food. Why? Nabatari, in order to test and to try him. And the most explicit of all verses, really telling us that this is without the shadow of a doubt something true. Verse number 155 in Surah Al Baqarah. Allah said, without a shadow of a doubt. There's no doubt about it. I will test you with something of khawf, of fear, dur, hunger, financial difficulties. In all of your livelihood, you will find some way, in some shape or form, test, trial and tribulation. There's no doubt about that. And this word, ibtila, did you know that in the Quran it is mentioned some 37 times in 8 different forms? Meaning, Allah spoke about testing us so much in the Quran that he really wanted us to take home one lesson with this that Allah intentionally is testing every single one of us and there are no exceptions to this rule had there been an exception it would have been the best of us the messengers and the prophets of Allah may Allah's mercy be upon them yet our prophet <coughs> was not spared he in fact went through the most difficult of all tests tested the most even and up to including the pangs of death, subhanAllah, to teach us, my brothers and sisters, test and trial, that is part of our life. No escaping it. And that is what moves us on to the second point. What does Allah want to see us do in times of test? One of us loses our job. One of us suffers, maybe a loved one passes away. Or it is to do with our whole family, or to do with our brothers and sisters somewhere out there, like today in Gaza. How does he want to see us respond? Well, look at the life of Yusuf alayhi salam. Tested throughout his life. Test began when he was just a young boy, maybe eight, nine, ten years old. Thrown into the bottom of the world. By his own blood, his own brothers. Envied and hated upon by his own brothers. And he was thrown into the world. Left for dead as a young boy, subhanAllah. Trauma at that young age, yes. Allah intended that for him. Test trial and then to move out of the well only to be sold into slavery and then to be raised up in the house of a cruel, wicked woman who desired evil from him. Another test on top of two more tests. And then right at the end, even though he is freed from prison, made the governor, the state treasurer of one of the greatest civilizations known to man, the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian empire, the test of authority. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimah Allah said these were the four tests that Allah put Yusuf al Islam through. Four different tests, four different times, but they're there in his life. Now the thing is, look to the end of his life, where things begin to take a U-turn, when things begin to become better, the reunion that happens between him and his brothers. His whole family are now coming back to Egypt. Unknowingly they are dealing with Aziz, but who is Aziz? Yusuf al Islam. Now when he exposed his identity, he drops the curtains. He's going to tell them that it is me. That young boy who you threw into a well once upon a time some 40 years ago. And I went through so many difficulties in my life. At that moment, he says to them, Ana Yusuf, wa hada akhi. It is me. I am Yusuf. And this is my younger brother, Bin Yameen. Now look at what he says. He says, indeed, Allah has favored us. Allah has favored you? But you just went through some difficult times. What about these people? They, you are, they're like your enemies. They threw you into a well. Surely you're gonna, you're gonna take them to task for what they did. Surely you're gonna tell them about all of the difficulties you went through in your life. But no, he glossed over all of the difficulties. He said, oh, the man Allahu alayna. He said, Allah has favored me, blessed me, because what they see now is a man in a state of authority, a man living in luxury, a man in the circles of royalty. So he's saying, look at the positives. 
Look at the positives of my life and I'll teach you something now, my brothers. And by extension, all of us. How I manage to excel. How I manage to reach the status in my life. He said, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ عَجَرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ He said, I became a muhsin. One who excels in rank before Allah's sight. How did I reach the stage? Well, you know those difficulties? I'm going to talk about those difficulties. I'm going to teach you how I overcome those difficulties. How I met those tribulations with this type of behavior. I face every one of my challenges with sabr and with taqwa. Sabr and taqwa. Sabr and taqwa. And that is how I find myself now as a muhsin. One who excels in Allah's sight, as Ibn Jawzi said, he is now saying, now I am reaping the benefits of the dunya and the akhirah. Dunya and akhirah come to my feet. Why? Because I struggled in times of ibtila by exercising sabr and taqwa. So look at his life. Thrown into prison for no good reason. Like our brother Muslim, languishing in prison now for no good reason. Not even being given a sentence to serve. Just be thrown into prison. وَدَخَلَ مَعَهُ فَتَيَانِ And then Allah says, now look, when he's in prison, dealt with unjustly, being taken away from normal life and being told that you're going to be living in a cell for the rest of, for the rest of your dying days, Allah said, two other inmates entered upon with him. Meaning two young criminals actually came into prison at the same time as Yusuf alayhi salam. What did he do? They came to him and they said, you know what, we've had dreams. I've had a dream and he's had a dream. Look at Yusuf alayhi salam. He took that opportunity to do da'wah to them. He called them to Allah. He called them to Allah and told them to absolve themselves from their polytheistic ideal, the mushrikun. And so he said, this life you're living, it is totally wrong. You need to worship Allah, become slaves of Allah. But subhanAllah, doing da'wah, you know, when, when you've got money, when you've got loved ones, when you're out and about, it's tough, but it's not as tough as having to do da'wah when you're inside a prison, being dealt with unjustly in times of tribulation. But he said, that was my sabr. You see, Allah put me in that test. I couldn't do anything about it. There's nothing I could have done. So the maximum I could have done was to remain patient and devout to Allah. So he did da'wah in prison, subhanAllah. Just like the Prophet in Makkah, around the sixth year of Prophet, in Makkah, living in a time of oppression, hostility, they gave him tough time of Quraysh. They said, renounce your faith, renounce your prophethood, tell your believers they better change their views. If they don't change their views, then we're going to kill them. We're going to torture them. And so the Prophet as Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, he did something very similar to what Yusuf did. He chose the shi'r of Banu Hashim. He chose the mountain path of Banu Hashim to take himself and his followers into the middle of a mountain track. To live in hunger, to live boycotted. They couldn't even marry their own off to anybody else. Totally boycotted and isolation. He said he chose that lifestyle over a situation where some of his followers may have to give up their own Islam. That was the sabr that the Prophet is teaching us there. That in tough times, remain firm. Soldier on in your commitment to Allah, never give up. That is a sabr that Yusuf had. And then he said, I had taqwa too. And taqwa helped me to attain my success as well. Have you had taqwa? Well, think about when he was inside the home of that wife of Aziz. A slave living in the house of his master. And what did she do? She said, Hey Tarak, Ghalaqatil Awab. She closed up all the doors, all the locks on the doors. She shut them, bolted them. No one could possibly find out what is going to happen. And then she called him a command, Hey Tarak, come, meaning command to do zina wa billah. And look at Yusuf alayhi salam. I mean, he had every reason to say, you know what, it is too difficult. How can I, res- how can I refuse this lady? She's my master. She's closed off all the doors. This is the house of a politician. No one's really going to find out about this scandal. Every reason to say, you know what? I can't do anything. He said, with you, Allah, do I seek a place of refuge. Exercise taqwa in a difficult time. And you know what? That's a lesson for us, subhanAllah. That sometimes when we find ourselves in difficult times, when we lose a job, when we lose a loved one, 
then there's so many options available. You know, like the non-Muslims, when they lose their job or they may be done, what do they do? They go and drown their sorrows, don't they? They go and drown their sorrows, meaning they knock back the alcohol. That is their way out. Yeah? In times of tribulation, there's many ways out. There's, there's a way out doing haram, and there's a way out doing halal. For Yusuf salam, the way out was haram and halal. He could have done haram, and that would have been his way out. But he said, no. Ma'adullah, he taqwa. He said, my way out, even if it's prison, then I'll choose prison. So he's telling us and he's teaching us, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ عَدَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ That Allah will never look upon you, my brother and my sister, seeing that you are in difficult times and yet you're still remaining sabir, patient, disciplined, maintaining your commitment to Allah and His commandments and seeing that though you could have turned away from Him, you instead decided to be truthful to him, exercising taqwa, and he will never render in vain what he sees before you. And that leads us on to the third point. What does Allah desire from tests? What benefit do they serve? Inshallah, we will cover them in the second part. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala tamani akbalani khayri khalqi lahi ajma'in. Nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Five benefits, five wisdoms as to what ibtila, test, trial and tribulation serve. First and foremost, the Prophet ﷺ told us in a hadith reported by his beloved wife Aisha radiallahu ta'ala in Sahih Muslim that there is no calamity, there is no difficulty, affliction. Hatta shoka, even the pricking of the thorn, when it comes to a believer, except that Allah writes for him one hasra, and Allah omits for him one khati'ah, one misdeed, one sin. That through trial and tribulation, if you are strong, disciplined, and behave in a way that Allah loves, then the first thing that you will be granted is reward. And on top of that, Forgiveness from some of the wrong you have done. I mean, come on, my brothers and sisters. Is there any one of us that doesn't desire some good deed before Allah? Is there any one of us who is not in need of forgiveness? No, for sure. And that is the first positive consequence of going through trial and tribulation. Reward and being forgiven of sin. The second is that trial and tribulation, in fact, show us that Allah, in fact, loves you more than the next person. The Prophet said in a hadith, say Bukhari, that whoever Allah desires good for, you sib minhu, that he puts him to trial. How comes, Ya Allah? Well, because, my brothers and sisters, it's all well and good claiming that you're Muslims in good times. When, when you have money, when you have loved ones, when you have a good state of well-being, it's, it's very easy to say, I'm a believer in Allah. But when the going gets tough, in that case, if you remain true, well, for sure, for sure you are. So in order to bring out the truth of your faith and the purity of it and to cement it and to make it strong, does Allah trial people? And if he trials a believer in this way, he in fact wants good for him. Second thing, that Allah in fact loves you. Allah loves our brothers and sisters out there or suffering brothers. Allah loves them and he shows them his love by in fact testing them and trialing them in order to make purer the iman in him. The third. The third is that trial and tribulation is like a mirror to us. It shows us things hidden deep within inside of us that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. Think about the battle of Uhud. In the battle of Uhud, my brothers and sisters, the Muslims suffered. They suffered big time. Why did they suffer? Many reasons. One of them is because the Prophet ﷺ gave direct commandments to all his army. You stay here, you stay here, these are your orders. Like the archers, he gave them an explicit order, remain on top of that hill and cover our back. Don't move from there even if you see us winning or even if you see us losing. However, وَفَشِلْتُمْ وَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرَ Allah said in Surah Al-Imran that they differed amongst themselves and they faltered. They disobeyed the command of the Prophet Now, that triggered many calamities upon them. Many calamities. Allah said about 
that whole event afterwards that from amongst you are some that desire the dunya and from amongst you some are those who desire the akhirah Ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala he said you know before the descending of this ayah I would never have known that from amongst us are people that desire the dunya subhanallah so by Allah testing the believers that time he showed them something hidden that you never knew that you had weaknesses in this regard. Some of you in fact desired the dunya. Now through that test, did you come to know it? So now you can work on that. Now you can purify yourself from that. Look at our times. Look at our times with everything happening in Gaza. How many of us, for example, are prepared to do the minimum and to refrain from buying Israeli goods in supermarkets. How many of us even know how to read the label that shows that this is in fact made in occupied land? You have a label that says Israeli goods. You have a label that says made in the West Bank, bracket settlements. You have a label that says made in the Jordan Valley. All of these things are made on, on our soil, on the soil of the Palestinians, illegally occupied land. Something so small for us to say, we're not going to buy this. In fact, we're going to call the manager and say, how can you sell these things? How dare you sell these things when they are being accused of war crimes? Something so small. How many of us are prepared in the hot, sweltering heat to go out, stand the whole day in protest, wherever that may be happening? How many of us are prepared to, how many of us are prepared to continue to make dua for our brothers there? How many of us are prepared to continue to dig deep in our pockets, to give to those people? Minkum may you read the dunya. Isn't that true? That's how many of us are really true to our brothers and sisters out there. How many of us? Oh, we only know the reality of this when the test actually comes about. So this is yet another benefit of test and trial. Another benefit is that through these times, testing times of Allah, show us who are the munafiqun. And that Allah show us who are the believers. Again, the battle of Uhud. There was a huge army. Huge army of the Muslims camped there at Uhud. Battle is just about to commence. 300 or so munafiqun get up and leave. Just before the battle is about to commence, yes. Just before the battle, all of them get up and leave. Now they are being identified. Though they were living all amongst us, we never knew who was a monarchy. We never really knew who was an enemy from amongst. We thought we were all the same. We never really knew. Oh, when the test came about, Allah said, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ يَوْمَ الْتَقَلْ جَمْعَانِ فَبِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَلْيَعْلَمَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلْيَعْلَمَ الَّذِينَ نَافَقُمْ Allah said here, this is another benefit of why I tested you. مَا أَصَابَكُمْ What afflicted you when the two armies came together, meaning at Uhud? Why? In order that the believers may become known and identified. They remained. They remained for the battle. And those hypocrites, well, they became identified. They became exposed and looking even in our times. Deafening silence coming from the Arab leaders. Deafening silence. Even the non-Muslims are pointing at Saudi Arabia, at Egypt at the UAE and saying, how comes there is no criticism? How comes they are not, you know, decrying this oppression in the strongest possible terms? What is it? What is happening? We would have thought we would have heard something from them. <laughs> Through these testing times that Allah show us, Muslims wake up. Look at those people. Look at them. Are they really true Muslims? And now look at those. Be with those people, true believers standing up for my sake. Be with them and be wary of them. How do you even come to know of them? Ah, because of testing times. And the last point. The last point is that through trial and tribulation, does Allah prepare you, your family, the society of this ummah for great things. Look at the life of the Prophet 13 years in Makkah was he tried. 13 years were the Muslims tortured, abused and ridiculed. 13 years, that's a hell of a long time. After 13 years, they migrated to Medina as fugitives. And in Medina, what did they face? They had to go to war. Badr, Uhud, Khandaq, Khaybar. After war and battles in the 8th year after Hijrah, 
Did the conquest of Makkah happen? And the eighth year, 13 years, and another eight years of hardship, testing and trial, now you are ready. Now you are ready to take the reins of leadership. Now you are ready and made yourself into recipients of my nasr. And now, now you are seeing a complete change of it. Now you are seeing people entering my deen in droves. Now you have become the leader of the greatest city, not just of the Arabian Peninsula, but the greatest city of this entire world, Makkah al Mukarramah. Did Allah, through those years of testing and trial, did He prepare them for something great? And in the same way does Allah test and trial us today. To prepare us, my brothers and sisters, to see who responds positively, to see who is active for His deen, in order to prepare us for something great. May Allah, Jalla wa'ala, help us in these times of need. May Allah alleviate the suffering that our Muslim brothers and sisters are going through. May Allah make us sincere, true worshippers of Him. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Rabbana, zalamna anfusana. وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنْ خَاسِرِينَ رَبَّنَا إِنَّنَا آمَنَّا فَاغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ رَبَّنَا اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين وذل الشرك والمشركين ودمر أعداء الدين اللهم انصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وجعلنا منهم اللهم اخذل من خذل دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا تجعلنا معهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وأكيم الصلاة